before we get into the word. Father, we praise you and we thank you in this place tonight. Lord, we thank you that uh, where your spirit is, the spirit of prophecy is, Father. And so we thank you, Lord, for just this word that came forth. We thank you for um, the message that goes out, that ministers, the word that ministers, your spirit that ministers, Father. We thank you that we can be in this house tonight and freely worship you, um, come before you, Father, seek your face. We thank you for miracles, healing, deliverance, all the things that you do in our hearts when we come together as a body. And we all say together, amen. Amen, amen. So um, tonight's word is called release it to me. Release it to me. God began to speak to me this week about uh, the fact that he was shaking the heavens and shaking the earth. And I want to read some scriptures to you to kind of help you um, understand that or get, get into that frame of, of mind of what does this mean. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 26 through 28. The word says that at that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Now, what does this mean? When God speaks prophetically that he's shaking the heavens and he's shaking the earth, it means that he's taking uh, the people of God, he's taking the earth environment, he's taking the heavenly environment, he's emerging them together, and he's shaking so that what needs to be shaken off will come off. He only wants certain things to remain. And so... Uh, here as we're approaching the end of 2018 before stepping into our Gregorian calendar year of 2019, what God is doing is he is shaking some things in your life. And when God begins to shake things, many times we feel like our foundation is shifting and we're not quite sure where to stand. There are certain things that become hindrances to our relationship with God. And so when he starts shaking things around us, sometimes we're not even completely aware of what's happening. But we find that we go into intercession. We find that we go into prayer. We find that we start mourning for things that we're not even quite sure what we're mourning for or about. We find that um, the things that we've held on to tightly are starting to begin to... Uh, come out of our hand. When a shaking takes place, we are uh, being positioned by God to release things to him, things that have been in the way of our relationship with him. If you remember at the beginning of the month, we talked about the fact that this was a month that God would take us deeper in him. He would take us deeper in him because in January is going to be a time of purification and consecration before he uh, repositions you in around the February time frame for new opportunities. See, God already knows the opportunities that are coming to you, but you might not yet be prepared for them. So God prepares his people by putting them through a shaking process. And so I literally saw in the spirit realm the heavens shaking. I saw as the heavens began to shake, God was saying, I'm sending these rumblings, I'm sending these shakings, because I'm quaking my people to wake up and begin to start praying, begin to start seeking my heart, begin to start releasing these things to me that I'm asking for. Does anybody understand what I'm saying in this place? Have you felt a need to pray this week? Have you felt a need to let go of some things and you can't really understand why? Maybe it's not even things, it's people. It's relationships. Have you, have you felt a shaking where you needed to let go of disappointment or hurts? It's because God is saying those things are a graveyard in your life. Those things are tombstones. Those things are places that 
I need you to leave it behind. I need you to leave it there. And sometimes we're not even aware that we walk amongst the tombs or that we walk in graveyards of past things until shaking happens. Because when shaking happens, then we, our emotional states and our spiritual states begin to connect. And then we begin to start feeling like, well, I've got to pray because I don't understand why I'm going through this. I can't put my finger on it. Exactly. I may be able to articulate some of it, but it's deeper than that. And you see, God wants to take you to these deeper places here this month because he's getting you ready for purification and consecration. People who are purified and consecrated through praying, fasting, and giving, which is getting ready to come up in January, people who are set up that way have to have gone through a process of letting some of these things go. And so it's right that God would begin to shake the heavens and the earth at this time. You know, technically, this is not really Christmas, as in accordance to when they say Jesus was born. This is just what we do on the Gregorian calendar, right? That was set up by Constantine. But it would be right that when the birth of Jesus would come about, there was a shaking of the heavens and the earth. There was a release of the angelic heavenly host. There were things that changed and people that felt a call to come forth to God. And so it is right that we are in this place at this time. And so if you, if you felt like you can't quite understand it, but you're going through groanings and utterings that you don't really grab a hold of, really understand from the logical standpoint, it's a spiritual thing. We know from Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 22 and 24, the word says that we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, that is those who are saved, we have the first fruits of the Spirit of the Lord on the inside of us. We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, we were saved. Then if you go on to verse 26, it says, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So if you found that you're in that place this week, you're in the right place. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm in the right place. It's always good to know sometimes when we're in the right place. So creation is groaning right now. Creation is in a place of frustration. But let me tell you what is good about this. What is good about this is when we leave in the graveyard what needs to be left and we learn the strategies to reposition ourselves, we will come out of this year with a new anointing on our life. And then as we go through that purification and consecration process, we will be ready for what God has for us in February. And then, of course, the calendar begins to turn over again, God's calendar, as we go quickly into Passover after that. So, we're in this process of earth shaking, heaven shaking, earth shaking. We're praying, we're seeking him. And God is, is speaking to us about where our position needs to be in this. See, sometimes when you begin to get into those deep places with God, you can get, uh, you can get stuck in the letting go process. And so when he says, I want you to release it to me, it means I need you to let go of those disappointments, of those hurts, of that pain. I need you to release it to me. And many times we don't want to release it to him. You know, I, I, I've actually talked to people who, who talk about their brokenness, and they carry it sometimes as though it were a badge of honor. Listen, your brokenness is a fruit that causes you to be able to have compassion and comfort for another person, but it's not supposed to be something that you carry which causes you to, to main, maintain a place in a graveyard where you cannot be released. See, we have to understand that, that, that brokenness is a good thing. 
But if it keeps us in a place that God doesn't want us to be, then it's overused. It becomes a self. It becomes a badge. It becomes something that we wear. And, and God wants us to get beyond this. Yes, he wants you to have comfort for others and to pray for others, but he doesn't want you to stay in this place of brokenness. He wants you to learn the strategies to get to the place in him where then that brokenness can be beneficial and not be a place where it takes you down. And so during the shaking process, if you found yourself uh, hugging your brokenness and not wanting to let it go, God says, release it to me. Release it to me. If there's people in your life you haven't wanted to let go of, oh, Lord, I can't let go of them. Lord, there's, there's, there's no way I can, I can let you have this, have this person. God says, release it to me. Release that person to me. Maybe your time is up. Maybe your, your moment with them is up. Release it to him. Because even people will hold us in a place that God does not want us to stay in. Allow your brokenness to be a place of fruitfulness, not a place where you remain. Now, I want to talk to you about strategy here. Because it, when we begin to talk about groanings and utterings or creation shaking, it, it puts us on a rocky foundation and we say, well, what is right then? I mean, I've carried this with me for such a long time. It would feel uncomfortable for me to give it to you, Father. It would feel uncomfortable for me to release it to you. Or, I don't really want it, and I never have, but I can't let go of it. It, it looks, it's been looking so good on me for all these years, I'm not sure I can let it go. I've told all my friends about this thing. Like, how am I going to let this thing go for real? How am I going to step into that place of faith that you have called me to be in? So let's go to Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 24. This is the scripture before we talk about the creation uh, being in a place of groaning. Verse 18 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Now, I'm just going to camp out there. Let me tell you something that God is doing right now with this shaking. In addition to wanting you to release these very things, these pains, these hurts, uh, people, um, different things that you happen to be mourning right now and or grieving. In addition to that, he's saying, listen... I have an eager expectation for my children to be revealed. Okay? Now, this is why this is important for the body of Christ. You see, in the heavenly realms, there's an eager expectation that we, the body of Christ, would know where we are properly positioned. There's an eager expectation by heaven because of what the Son has done that we as the people of God would come to a place of realizing our proper position in the Lord. There is an eager expectation that says, Church, Jesus Christ's church, raise up and be positioned where God himself is and nothing less. There is an eager expectation that heaven has that it can cry out, that heaven itself can cry out, the children of God have been revealed. Now, what am I saying? You might say, whoa, that's pretty intense stuff, Pastor Candace. Now, listen, when heaven cries out in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed, God is calling for a revolution. He is calling for people to stand up and say, I know who I am. I know where I'm positioned. I know what I'm called to do. And I will be a part of the shaking of heaven and not the shaking of the earth. I will be seated properly with him and I will maintain my position there regardless of what I'm going through. See, there are things you are going to go through, but the graveyard smells and people mess in the graveyard every day. The graveyard and the tombs are where death lies. There is nothing about death in your Savior. See, if you are adopted as a son or a daughter, then you should be emanating life everywhere that you go. 
And if you're not, you have to ask the question, what is it that you want me to release to you, Father? Because there's an eager expectation that I would be a child of God responding to the world as you would have me respond as a child of light. See, when the heavens shake, light and the glory of God goes and spreads itself all over the universe. Did you hear what I said? Light and the glory of God. In light and the glory of God, there is purity there is cleanliness, there is holiness, there is righteousness, there is eager expectation that the universe is doing and responding exactly the way God would want it to respond. Knowing what? Knowing who the Savior is to them. Each one of you have been given an opportunity for a personal relationship with God, right? We Christians, when we encounter a religious spirit, what do we say? Oh, well, they just don't know God. They don't have a personal relationship with him. Come on, you know what I'm talking about, evangelistic, non-denominational folk. Oh, you know, they just don't have a personal relationship with God. So if you have a personal relationship with God, then you should be emanating light and you should be responding as a child of God in the circumstances that you've been placed in. You see, if the heavens are shaking with the glory and light of God, it's God himself exclaiming to the universe, these are my kids, now watch them respond. They're going to respond with glory. They're going to respond with light. They're going to respond with love. They're going to respond with purity. They're going to respond with who I am. Those are my kids, and they have the DNA of me. But we can't do that if we don't release it to him. He says, release it to me. You see, when you give God that person, or you give God that pain, or you give God that disappointment, or you give God that loss, or you give God that grievance, who are you giving it to? You're giving it to God. He takes that thing, and he releases you to be able to go do and be what it is that he's called you to be, that purity, that light, all of those things, to the rest of the world. I hear somebody talking back to me. Help us. I like people who talk back. You're welcome to talk back in this house. Talking back's okay. Some places that ain't allowed, but freedom does see it's allowed. You can talk back. Mm-hmm. So, so there's an eager expectation for us to rise up and get properly positioned. How do we do that? Now, let me give you the how. How? Because a lot of people are like, oh, okay, I hear what you're saying. I can grab a hold of it. I don't know how to make that work. I want that, God, but I don't know how to make that work. Okay, here's strategy. Here's strategy. The word says in Romans chapter 6 that you died with Christ, you were buried in him, and you are resurrected with him. That's what the word says. It says when you are resurrected, then where are you seated? Are you seated here or are you seated there? There. That's now your proper seat. Okay? So... When we're dealing with pain, disappointment, loss, grievances, relationships that are not working, things that God says release to me, then what we have to do is we have to remember our own resurrection. You see, here's the beauty of the resurrection. The Word tells us that we we died to the law, okay? That we might be with Him and alive in Him and resurrected in Him, okay? So grievances or pain or loss or brokenness, lost expectations too. I'm going to talk about that, right? If you have an expectation and somebody doesn't meet it, it is just as painful as if a law was broken. Our expectations are our own structures that rule our life and they create so many problems for us. We're comfortable with them. But they can kill us. And so God says, what I need you to do is I need you to leave all of that there. Because that was created from the fall. It was your way of holding on and getting yourself in order. See, that's why the law came before grace. is because the law helped them build a structure that they knew they couldn't abide by. And then God said, now look at my son because he takes care of the structure. 
okay? He doesn't abolish the structure. He takes care of fulfilling the structure. And so when we talk about strategy, we say, God, we're going to leave this here by understanding that you killed us away from it. You loved us so much that you put us on the cross with you. Now, here's the thing. See, he leaves the sin. He leaves all these things, okay? He leaves the law. He leaves it there. But he whoop, takes us out of it. He takes you out of the things that he allows to stay in your life, but says release to me, right? The things that you struggle with. He gives you an opportunity to put the cross of Christ and the resurrection power to work. He says, leave it there in the tombs, just like he was buried, right? You leave it there and you resurrect with him. Okay, so this is, this is where it gets really practical. So I want you to think about the thing that's paining you the most right now. What's the thing that's driving you? Everybody take a moment to think. Think of the thing that's driving you to pray so much. Now, you're a good Christian. You're praying for that thing. You want to see that thing change. But God says that thing is a noose around your neck. I need you to leave it right where it's at because you died with me. You are buried in me. Okay, so you're buried in the tomb, and now you're going to resurrect out of it. But where's that thing? If you died, that thing gets to stay there. You left it there. Because when you resurrect, you can't take it with you. See, you die naked, you get buried naked, and you rise naked. So when he says, you died with me, he's saying, listen, I killed all that away. I buried it. And now I'm going to raise you in the power and in the love and in the joy and in the peace that I've called you to. And I want you to be properly seated with me now as an eager expectation. You are a child of God and this is your proper position. See, when we begin to operate as though if you can't take care of that thing that you're praying about, and it's a burden to you, Part of releasing it to him means leave it in the ground. So that by his power, you resurrect, but it stays. If it stays and you're here, does it have to touch you? No. Now, if you're going to choose to pray about it because there's a real and generalized concern for that, and you know it's God's concern too, then you pray about it from here. You pray about it from this position. Then you don't wear the weight over it. Then it doesn't kill you because you already died to it. It doesn't noose your neck. You pray from here. See, the children of God should pray from here. You don't pray from here. You pray from here about here. But the children of God are praying down here about this, and there's no power, and nothing's being released, and nothing's being changed. And God says, I'm shaking it off. Get yourself properly positioned as a child of God and work with me to pray about the earth and how it needs to be changed, but not because you're of the earth. You're of the heavens, and you're praying from that position first. Why can I say that this is truth? Because if you're a Christian and you believe in the resurrection, the resurrection is the answer for everything. See, when the disciples talked about the resurrection, Jesus would speak to them about the fact that that's where the answer lies. It lies in the resurrection. Christians who uh, believe in Jesus dying on the cross for them and don't believe in the resurrection are not Christians at all because it's the resurrection that gives us the power. It's not the death. And so if you're going to have power as a child of God, then where's your power come from? In the death or in the resurrection? Because that's him, that's the, his way, and he was our example. So if you think you're going to have power then you have to think about the fact that his power resides there. That's where my power needs to reside. Now, if the man wants to come up. So here's the deal. The church of Jesus Christ has to understand that God is calling it 
to be a voice from the position of the heavenlies, not this position anymore. When he says, I've come to shake the heavens and the earth, he means I've shaken the earth so that what is in the earth can can uh, be viewed from the standpoint of heaven. It will not remain if it is shaken. If the earth is shaken and something can no longer stand, then that means that it doesn't have the power of the resurrection behind it, and you need to leave it in the tombs. That's where it belongs. So when you think about where you're at right now, going deeper with God, think about the things that you need to leave here in the tombs. If it makes you feel dead, then it needs to stay dead. Okay, that's a clear sign. If it makes you feel dead, leave it in the tombs. And ask him to give you life above it. Because he already made the way. He made the way 2,000 years ago. See, that's what we boast about. We boast in Christ. We boast about what he did, right? And so if we're boasting about what he did, why would we boast about something that's not relevant to today? What's the point? We boast in what's relevant in the here and now. He says, I want my children to be who I've called them to be. The creation groans in eager expectation that the children of God, the adopted sons and daughters of the Most High, would be revealed to the universe. But most of the time, the sons and the daughters of God are walking amongst the tombs, murmuring, complaining, acting like they're dead when he made them alive. Leave what's dead, dead. Release it to him and get to your proper place. Now, from a strategy standpoint, you won't be able to do this one time. I'm just telling you because I know human nature and I know how the mind works. You're going to have to die to these things over and over again until all of a sudden, no longer a problem for you anymore. That's part of healing. The strategy is leave it in the tombs. And when it start, when you start to feel like those tombs, this smell and the stench from the tombs is overcoming you, wake up and go, oh my God, I'm in that thing again. Leave it. I died with Christ. I've been buried in him and I've been resurrected with him. What am I doing smelling this stuff? Why am I here amongst the tombs? Why am I here amongst this depression, amongst this anxiety, amongst this worry? What am I doing here? This is not the proper position for a son or a daughter of the king. Wake up like it's smelling salts. Death smells. There's an eager expectation and the universe needs you. God needs you. The heavens need you to be saying, this is who I am and this is where I'm positioned. Does anybody understand what I'm saying in this place? So as we end this year, because the end of the year is coming to a close, take these strategies, and as the earth is shaking, because the heavens are shaking, the earth is shaking, take an inventory of what's being shaken. Ask God, how entrenched are you with this thing? Ask God how to release it to him. Ask God how to be resurrected above it. Ask God how to stay up there and not come down and walk through the tombs again to check on that thing. If it's dead, it's not coming back. Leave it there. Remain in the resurrected place. The universe needs you to be there. Now, I'm going to transition to the place where if there's somebody in the house tonight, and maybe you need some prayer. You need somebody to stand with you and agree with you in a prayer of faith believing for a healing, believing to leave the dead things where they need to be, Uh, calling forth from the inside of you who you really are and where you're properly positioned. The altar team is going to be up here. So we invite you to come up for prayer. If you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you don't yet have that power. So we're going to invite you to come up and let somebody on the altar team pray with you. 
so you can receive Jesus because it's by his power that everything I said today comes to pass, but you've got to have his power. You have to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. And then the word says you're saved and the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you. So let's stand to our feet. Let's worship the Lord in this place. And let's make it a point to be the children of God that we are called to be.